a mobile robot needs to be able to perform obstacle avoidance because there will be unforeseen roadblocks along the way from a start position to a goal position. In order to determine if there are objects there, the robot needs some exteroceptive sensors, meaning sensors that can determine something about the outside world. The most common one is sonar. This slide talks a little bit about the nuts and bolts of sonar. So we see here that there is a wave packet generated and then that wave packet propagates through the air, strikes the object, and is reflected back to the sensor. And it's the time of flight that gives an estimate for the distance to the object. Now there are a few details in implementing this. On the sensor, the driver, which generates the wave packet, and the sensor are combined. So before we listen for the, before the sensor listens for the echo, there's a pause to allow the driver to stop ringing, and that gives a blanking distance, which is a minimum detectable range. So for a little bit after the packet is generated, there's the sensor isn't listening. So if something were really close, it would reflect back then. And since the sensor is not listening, that's not detected. So we have a minimum detectable range for these sonar sensors. If we have multiple sonar sensors on our robot, then they fire sequentially so that one sensor's emitted packet doesn't interfere with the sensing from another uh, sonar sensor. And in order to determine if a signal received by the sensor is a valid echo, meaning that an object was detected, we have some threshold amplitude so that other sounds coming into the sensor aren't interpreted as objects. And this threshold can be adjusted. So at the beginning of the time that the sensor listens for an echo, the threshold could be high because a reflected sound wave would have a high amplitude if the object was close. And then as time goes on, the threshold could be lowered because a faraway object would have a weak reflected sound wave. Sonar sensors generally have a minimum range of 12 centimeters and a maximum range of 5 meters with a resolution of about 2 centimeters. One big problem with sonar sensors is reflection. When, well, whenever the signal is reflected away from the robot or away from the sensor. So you want it reflected back, but sometimes it's reflected away and that depends on the surface and the angle between sensor and surface. For example, this is a scan in 360 degrees for a robot located here in a room. And these lines show the detected distances to objects. So you can see that detection works well in some places, but then in others, nothing's detected. So at this angle, all the emitted wave is reflected away from the sensor, and so nothing is detected in this range. Now, back to obstacle avoidance. Exteroceptive sensors are what dictate the need for a trajectory change. In this figure, we show our nominal trajectory is a dashed line, but then some sensor finds an obstacle here, and we have to deviate from that nominal path. So the new trajectory depends both on the sensor readings and the robot's position relative to the goal. That defines what the robot's going to do. Two examples are presented in the following slides. We have the bug type algorithm and then vector field histogram. These are examples of obstacle avoidance approaches. Bug algorithms are inspired by insects and there are several variations such as bug zero, bug one, bug two, dist bug, tangent bug, eye bug. And these variations differ in the types of sensors and the amount of memory used. They all have the same general idea which is to follow an object perimeter in order to bypass it. So you do wall following. The robot just hugs the wall and goes around the perimeter of the object. And we assume that the robot can only wall follow on one side. So for example, if the cursor is the robot and encounters the object and goes this way around the object, then that's right wall following because it keeps the wall on its right side. If instead it went the other way, that would be left wall following. And when it comes to the next object, it would do left wall following again. So it's always going to do either left wall following or right wall following. Bug zero is the simplest of the bug algorithms, and it has no memory. The way it works is 
go it goes in the direction towards the goal until it encounters an obstacle and then it wall follows until the goal direction is clear then it heads towards the goal again until it encounters an obstacle follows it until the goal direction is clear so by no memory it means that there's no record of where it's traveled already it's only looking at the sensors and the goal direction question does bug zero guarantee completeness that means if there is a solution or a path to the goal does bug zero guarantee that the robot will find it so here's an example for you to look at and you should pause and think through for a second whether or not bug zero guarantees completeness and go ahead and pause From this example, you can see that bug zero does not guarantee completeness. This figure shows the path taken by the robot if it was executing the bug zero algorithm. Start off here, head towards the goal, encounter the obstacle and perform right wall following until the direction to the goal is clear again, which is this point. And then we go towards the goal, encounter an obstacle, perform right wall following, and the robot gets stuck in this loop. And it's problematic too if we did left wall following. It would go here until it, until the goal direction was clear, and then it would leave the wall following. So bug zero does not guarantee completeness. Bug one is an alternative. It's another bug algorithm, and it fully circles the obstacle. You can see here the robot starts here, and then it goes all the way around the obstacle it encounters. And this one does require memory. It remembers the closest point on that obstacle's perimeter to the goal. Once the robot has fully circled the obstacle, then it returns to that closest point. And from there, it leaves the obstacle and heads towards the goal. So it might seem that this is excessive to go all the way around the obstacle more than once, but it ensures a solution. This is a complete approach. As, as you can see, though, it can be inefficient, or it is inefficient, because it goes farther than it absolutely than it needs to. Bug two is a, a variation of this. Bug two, when it's going towards the goal, it's always on the same line. And this is the goal line. And that line connects the start point to the goal point. A robot executing bug two algorithm has two modes. It's either in goal seek mode or wall follow mode. This figure shows a robot executing bug two doing right wall following. So when there's no obstacle detected, we have goal seek mode. When obstacle is detected, we enter wall following mode until the robot reaches the goal line again. And if it reaches the goal line at a point closer to the goal than it has ever previously been, then it will return to goal seek mode. If it reaches the goal line and it's been closer than that before, then, well, if it's been on the goal line closer than that before, then it'll continue to wall follow. In this example, we see the robot do goal seeking, then wall following, and wall follow until it intersects the goal line. At that point, it's closer than when it left the goal line, so it returns to goal seek mode, then does wall following when it encounters another obstacle, and it wall follows until it gets to the goal line again, and since that point is closer than the point where it left the goal line, it returns to goal seek mode. This is a complete method. And here's another example of it. Goal seek, wall follow, until reaching the goal line, then goal seek again. This method can be faster than bug one, but it can also be slower. It just depends on the situation. By situation, I mean the environment or the map. Vector field histogram is a totally different approach, and it was created in order to avoid the problems from problems that arise from only using the latest sensor reading. This approach is based on a local occupancy grid, which gives a score to all the directions based on how many sits, uh, sonar hits have been detected in that direction, and once that number of hits re rises above a certain threshold, 
an obstacle is considered to exist in that direction. I say direction because we're talking about a polar histogram. So this shows, so by polar, polar histogram I just mean a histogram that gives the probability that there's an obstacle in that direction. This one shows directions from negative 180 to 180 degrees and then the probability that there's an obstacle in that direction. When a sonar hit is detected in that direction, that probability is incremented, and when no hit is detected in that direction, the probability is decremented. And that way, if the sonar reflects away from an object one or two readings, then we can still consider an object to be there because we have some history involved with the readings. Once we have this histogram we, and we determine where the objects are, then we need to make a decision on which direction to go. As a little aside, the, the VFH plus algorithm also includes kinematic location uh, limitations. For example, with this situation, the vector field histogram would give you obstacles in those two directions, but then VFH plus would include the fact that the robot at its current speed and parameters couldn't make this turn. So these directions are blocked off too. Now making a decision. The path chosen for the robot is determined by evaluating a cost function for every direction. This cost function G has three weighting parameters. A, B, and C. Now for each direction we will evaluate a value for G which is calculated as A times target direction plus B times wheel orientation plus C times previous direction. And these terms are defined here. Target direction is the difference between the direction we're evaluating and the goal direction. So that means if the goal was this way and we're looking at this direction, then that would be penalized because target direction would be far. The value for that would be big. If we're evaluating this direction and the goal direction is over here, we'd have a big difference between the two. Wheel orientation is the difference between the new the direction we're evaluating and the current wheel orientation. This would evaluate how much the robot has to turn. And then previous direction, this term represents the difference between the previously selected direction and the direction we're evaluating now. So if the last time we evaluated G, we chose a direction like this, and now we're looking at this direction, then previous direction would have a high value because the robot is, is making its way towards this direction, and if we are evaluating this direction, that would mean the robot would have to change its course again. So you can tune the behavior via these weighting parameters, A, B, and C. For example, if we make A much higher than B or C, then that would give us behavior that is aggressive towards the goal, meaning the cost of any direction that's far from the goal direction would be high. So we'd be less likely to choose paths that take us away from the goal direction. And these methods for obstacle avoidance can be implemented using the exteroceptive sensors on the robot.